My message is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Can people tell that we've been with Jesus? Hmm. Can people at work, can my neighbors, can my family tell that I've been with Jesus? Acts chapter 4. Beginning with verse 1, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will be our teacher, you'll be our guide, you will turn the searchlight on in our hearts, Lord, because your word tells us to examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith, to see if we're living as we should for you. So Holy Spirit, turn that light on in our hearts, in our lives this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Remember up to this point, right after the day of Pentecost, they were at about 3,200, 3, okay? You read what we just read? Many believed, so the number of men, and how did they count back then? Just the men. Most of those men were probably married with children. <laughs> so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day... The rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are now being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builder, you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. In this, we read of the first persecution of the church. It's significant. Back in Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through 11, Jesus had said to his disciples, and perhaps Peter and John made a mental note and were referring, thinking about this, when Jesus said, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say what is given to you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. The church was very young, it was very small very inexperienced, and weak compared to the Israelites who were against them, compared to the religious leaders who were against them. But as someone has said, one plus God equals a majority. So here were Peter and John standing in the face of several 
individuals and groups of people that Luke lists here. In fact, let's, let's go through them. In those first six verses, Luke lists 11 individuals or group representatives who were already opposed to the church. I mean, how old was the church? A few weeks. And already leaders in the society were opposing them and the disciples. First of all, there were the priests. Now, these were not the ones who came forward to serve once or twice in a lifetime for maybe three weeks at a time. This was a priestly caste. It was a group. And all of these that we're going to list off started out perhaps religious, but then became political. They acted politically. The priests were no different. Then it says the captain of the temple guard was there. The temple guard were the soldiers who had arrested Jesus. The captain of the temple guard was the second most powerful person in Jerusalem under the Romans and their army. And Peter and John got to host him that day. There were the Sadducees. You remember the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees? They were both religious groups. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. They believed that at the end there would be a resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. And like the old joke says, that's why they were sad, you see. So the Sadducees, they weren't a huge group, but they were a wealthy powerful kind of upper crust group that Peter and John got to host that day. <laughs> they, um, the Sadducees had made close ties with the Romans just to kind of keep, keep from rocking the boat. Then it says that the rulers were there. These were probably people in positions of authority, heads of government departments, you know, city council, governors, you know, what we would consider our leaders in society today, they were similar. The elders, this was a distinguished group of older men who lived in Jerusalem, and they had a lot of influence. They had gr grown probably a little starchy through the years, a little political. John and Peter got to host them that day, too. Teachers of the law. Elsewhere, they've been called scribes. They knew and copied the scriptures, literally letter by letter by hand. No computers, no typewriters. Everything was copied meticulously by hand. So much so that every time they wrote the name of God, they had to go take a bath. If the name was used twice in the same sentence, they got two baths because it was a sign of they were not worthy to write, even write the name of God. And they would go through a ceremonial cleansing after every time they did. Peter and John got to host them that day too. Then it mentions governmental leaders. It talks about Annas, who was the true high priest who had been deposed by the Romans. But in the Jewish minds, that made no difference because in their minds, the high priest was in for life. So in the Jewish minds, Annas was still the high priest. They still respected him as such. He'd been deposed by the Romans, however. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, is mentioned as also being there. He had been installed by the Romans to replace Annas. But again, in the Jewish minds, Caiaphas was not the high priest. Annas still was. Caiaphas and Annas had conspired at the trial of Jesus. Jesus appeared before each of them during his trial. 
Imagine what was going through Peter and John's mind. Here they were standing before the same governmental officials who had sentenced and condemned Jesus. Then it mentions John, not a disciple. He was, he was part of the, he was a member of the high priest's family, as was Alexander. And then it says, and other members of the high priest's family. This long list are the ones who called John and Peter, took them to task. So why were they upset? Let's look back at Acts 4, beginning with, with verse 2. It's, well, it, just reading verse 2, it says, They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, in other words, talking about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. For anyone to teach the people anything religious was a threat to the priests, to the rulers, to the elders, to the teachers of the law. That's why they'd had Jesus crucified. Back in John chapter 7, verse 56, they spoke of Jesus by saying, no one ever spoke the way this man does because he had authority. He hadn't attended their rabbinic schools, but he taught as one who has authority. That was how they described Jesus. And so when they got rid of Jesus, when they took him off the scene, they thought the threat was gone. But now, here are Peter and John in their faces. They certainly had never been to a rabbinic school. They were just fishermen. And that's how these leaders would have termed them, just fishermen. And yet, they were teaching the people. They were talking about spiritual things. They're fishermen. What do they know? And the people were listening. In a matter of a few days, very few, thousands of people came to believe in the gospel, in the resurrection of Jesus. Their central teaching was about Jesus and the fact that God had raised him from the dead. As I mentioned before, the Pharisees believed in a final resurrection. The Sadducees did not. But what was disturbing both of those groups was that the disciples were teaching about Jesus' resurrection because if that were true, then that would mean that Jesus really was who he said he was, that he truly was the unique son of God. And that everything he said he came to do, he could do. So this was a huge threat. Spiritually, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rule, you know. And then also governmentally. Because the people were falling for it. The people were believing. Which meant their hearts, their minds were changing. That was a threat. So what really did Peter and John face? These authorities used their raw power to intimidate the disciples. If you ever notice, wealthy people tend to intimidate others by trying to exert control, trying to exclude those who aren't as rich as they are from things, trying to oppress those who have less than they do. In governmental positions, they will use the courts, they will use officers, they will use weapons, they will use armies to intimidate those whom they feel are lesser than they are. Now, in this portion of scripture where it talks about them coming upon Peter and John, in the Greek, the word used says that the Sad Sadducees came upon the disciples quickly and threateningly. Probably sneakily, Peter and John were up there talking to people. They turned and looked, and there were the Sadducees ready to grab them. They used their authority to arrest them. They wouldn't have had to have arrested them right then and there. But they took them into custody and decided to let them cool off overnight in jail. 
The, the disciples showed courage in spite of the arrest, and that, that impressed the authorities. Because if you think about it, if they just took them at face value, here were some very courageous men who were also Christians. Hmm. But then if you look at it from the other angle, these are Christians who are really courageous. Where'd that come from? What do Christians today face by way of intimidation? Let's start half a world away. North Korea, China, Muslim countries. What do Christians in those nations face by way of intimidation? They're not allowed to openly or publicly worship. They're not allowed to publish, purchase, or use a Bible. Isn't it interesting? North Korean, Chinese, Muslim people know the power of a book. Isn't that interesting? They wouldn't be threatened by walking into a library. It's not the book that is the threat. It's the living, powerful word of God within it. I dare say some of them, meaning the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, some of them know more of the power of God's word than Christians do. Because think about it, if we knew more, believed more in the power of God's word, wouldn't we read it more? Wouldn't we memorize more of it? The amens are deafening me. Right? If we believed in the power of prayer more, wouldn't we pray more? Wouldn't we pray more specifically? Wouldn't we pray for more God-sized things <laughs> to happen? Some people in those nations, if they convert to Christianity, they're excommunicated from their families. They become dead to their families. That family no longer has a son. Some who convert to Christianity are not allowed jobs. How do they support their families? Intimidation. Okay, here's where you get to talk through your mask for a couple minutes. How do Christians in America, how are they sometimes intimidated? How are Christians in America sometimes intimidated for being a Christian? Talk to one or two of the people closest to you. If you've got to move together a little bit, that's okay. Wear your masks just to respect each other. Talk. Discuss it. How are Christians intimidated? Think about the news. Think about experiences you've had or your friends have had. How are Christians in America intimidated for being Christians. On your market set, go. <laughs> Just a couple minutes. I'll time you. Don't worry about that. How are Christians in America intimidated for being Christians? Do you have any questions? Let me know.
about another minute and a half. One more minute. Thirty seconds. You got one good answer, try get two. Ten seconds. Finish your sentence. <laughs> I'm going to ask for some responses representing your group. Be the first so nobody takes your answer. How are Americans sometimes intimidated for being Christians? Oh, no. Yes. We feel like uh, when they took prayer out of schools, they, they changed, the, they changed the, the landscape because children used to have respect and, and it feels like when they took the Bible out of schools, children lost respect. For their teachers and adults, they, they lost that amount of, of knowledge of school, of learning. Okay, once we see that, isn't, isn't that remarkable yeah. that yeah. that action had that effect on the students? Absolutely, because when we were, we were discussing that when we were in elementary school, that was part of our curriculum. I mean, it, was, wow. it wasn't, we weren't in a religious, I was in a public school, but still yet. When we said we, we were able to, we, we prayed, we said a prayer, I think, I don't remember what our father, our father was oh, okay. All our father in elementary school, along with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I don't think they do either one today. And when they took the pledge away, they took away respect for our nation as well. Right. That's yep. very good. Okay, anybody else? How about on this side? Okay, Alvin. A lot louder so they can hear. What do you mean? Intimidated by their lifestyle? You know, like For their lifestyle. Sin, you know, they drink and you know, or smoking or whatever. And you come across somebody and they're like, hey, what's going on? And they know you from church. And you just say, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? So, it's something. So, who's being intimidated there? I think the, the person. The, 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 the saved or the unsaved? The unsaved. The unsaved yeah. are intimidated by us. Okay, so that's the opposite of what we're asking. But that's a good point. That's a good point. It, they can be intimidated by us. What does it depend on? How we approach them. True. Oh, true. But a lot of it, I mean, even then, we want them to feel convicted but not condemned. So I think you're talking the con condemnation side, you know, how we come across shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that, don't, yeah, okay, okay, good point. Anybody else? How about this side? Jalen? We get um, ridiculed. Ridiculed for? For reasons. Okay. And it's a fairy tale. It's all, you know, Okay. <laughs> okay. And um, they don't see it like we do, so we get ridiculed So we get ridiculed for what we believe, and then also... Which is not doing what they do, right? Yeah. 
Exactly. Very good. This side, got another response? How are Americans sometimes intimidated for being Christians? Carnation? How do you mean? What is good is now uh, looked upon as bad. And what was bad is looked upon as, okay, it's yeah. okay, it's good. Uh, my, my cousin is in Germany right now, and her son has a girlfriend. And all she knows about Americans, because she's German, I guess it comes from the media. And so when she met her boyfriend, Oh. And, and it was a shock, mm -hmm. you know, to my cousin. But to her, it was, hey, isn't that the way it is? Mm -hmm. You know, so what was good and uh, righteous? And do you know, it's so blatant, and it kind of makes us look dumb. They actually changed the words. Oh, listen to this song, it's so bad. Right, Precious? Right? It's so sick, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they even, I mean, like, they, could they be more obvious? They actually changed the word. They actually made them mean the opposite. And we just went, ah, no big deal. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, one more. Who wants to get yours in? Uh, the trust that used to be a family, Abraham, mm -hmm. uh, they took it down because the thing that you have built there, they don't want to see family anywhere around. Well, they, they told us they had to be fair. So they couldn't have representat representations of Christian things if they couldn't have Muslim and Hindu and yeah. So that's how they intimidated Christians by removing it, making it sound like, oh, we're just trying to be fair. And what about, I mean, this isn't religiously so much oriented, but what about the taking down like of all the, the Confederate and the, the historical statues around the nation. What is that telling? What is that telling people their age about America, about American history, about, I mean, that's not to say all of them were good guys. They weren't, because they're not all good guys today. But it's still a part of American history. There was the good, there was the bad, there was the ugly, but there was the beautiful too. So what message is that conveying? It makes me wonder, did the, are, are the people of Germany not part, did they do the same thing with the Nazis? I mean, you know, did they not talk about it? Mm. Like it never happened? You know, Carnation? Huh? How did the Germans uh, how, how deal they, today with the, the Nazi situation? Do they pretend it didn't exist? Like we're doing away with statues and of, of the Confederate Army. They, they don't take down the stuff. It's still there, but they don't like to talk about. They don't it. talk about it. Yeah. So, like, it's, when it's brought up in conversation. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a shame. And then you have the extreme. Really, they're, they, they, wow. Okay, that's interesting. So, to kind of sum up maybe what, what we've said here, sometimes Americans, American Christians, are intimidated by the fact that rights are taken away, right? Didn't some of us kind of say that? Some of our rights are removed. Our representation in government is removed, is taken away from us. Um, you know, like Jolyn mentioned, you know, certain belief systems, certain um, lifestyles are given prominence, they're given support, they are um, verbally supported, you know, don't you dare say anything about them. Christians, what? 
Don't even mention that word. Yeah, yeah. So our rights, our representation is sometimes removed. Image, yeah. Exactly. So it's totally out of it. I mean, yeah. yeah. And so that, that gives a message to the priest. Yeah, it does. It totally does. So there is mocking, there is intimidation, calling outdated, like you just mentioned, those who hold and speak out for Judeo Christian beliefs and values. And we're supposed to just let it happen. Just turn a, a deaf ear, turn a blind eye, and oh well, you know, that's America. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. We need to speak up. We need to run for offices. Yes. Mothers are no longer mothers, they're birthing people. Ladies, would you like to be known as a birthing person? An it? <laughs> it's kind of an it, right? Yeah, you're right. Changing terminology, changing titles, names, because it, it makes lesser than what has come before. But what these authorities learned in the New Testament and other intimidators since then have learned is that it's, if it's a good idea, especially if it's something spiritually oriented, the way to get rid of it, the way to stamp it out is not by intimidation or threats. It may work for a while. It may push them underwater for a while, but they're going to they're gonna bob back up. They're not going to disappear forever. You look at Military, you look at governmental leaders down through history who have tried to destroy Christianity by threats. It hasn't worked. We're still here. What Peter and John are experiencing was the first or the very early of many and much that has happened through history. Before this event occurred, if you look back at verse 4, Interestingly, it says, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. This was before this intimidation took place. Already, thousands more people had been added to the church. And yet these leaders thought that if they made threats and intimidated and, you know, arrested them, made them think, oh, more and worse is going to come, Right? But Peter and John didn't shut up. This message is building on what happened when the lame man was healed. Amen. Our message next time is going to carry on from this point. Because this is only the beginning of Peter and John's courage. But let's continue on. In a matter of several days, the church had grown from 3,200 or so to over 5,000. That's an increase of 55 to 60% in a matter of days. That's awesome. The more the church is oppressed, the more the gospel spreads. About 100 to 165 AD lived a man who came to be known as Justin Martyr. What is a martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R? A person who dies for their beliefs, okay? Justin was a Greek Samaritan philosopher. I thought that was kind of interesting. He was a Greek Samaritan philosopher who became a Christian through the witness of an old man that he just met on the street one day. I'd say it was a God sighting. It was a God thing, <laughs> 
He got saved and he became a great evangelist, winning many Romans to Christ. He defended Christianity and Christians. In other words, he defended Christianity as a whole, but he also defended individual believers when that became necessary. He eventually was killed for his faith. He was initially referred to as Justin the Martyr, and then pretty soon it just got shaved down to Justin Martyr. <laughs> He's famous for several quotes. One of the most impactful is this. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In fact, um, not the one we support, Voice of the Martyrs, but the other one. <laughs> Open Doors, I think it is. I believe they use this quote from him as kind of one of their themes or bylines. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. People try to persecute the church to get rid of it, not realizing that because God is involved, the church will grow. Look at China. Look at the underground church in China and in other nations. Missionary, a missionary went to one of them. I think it was in China, but I forget. And he told them, you know, we're going to pray for you that you will have the freedom like America. And they said, oh, don't ever pray that for us. We don't want to be like America. That got the missionary's attention. A lot of times, the Christians who are underground are a whole lot stronger in their faith than we are because we've had it really easy. What helps a church, a church, what helps a tree to grow strong? The roots, because they're getting their nutrients. What else? What? What? Okay, son, what else? I think there was some over Wind. How would the wind help a tree grow? Well, yeah, okay. But how would it make a tree grow? Exactly, strengthening it. Winds of opposition come, right? The tree stands up against it, all the time becoming stronger. Opposition, persecution comes against the church. How do we get stronger? Opposing that opposition. I mean, that yeah, opposing their opposition of us. So we can actually thank persecution for helping us grow. And that's exactly what it did for the church in the book of Acts. Around this same time, 69 to 155 AD, lived another individual who was an early church father. And it says about him, the emperors of Rome had unleashed bitter attacks against the Christians during this period, 69 to 155 AD. And members of the early church recorded many of the persecutions and deaths. Polycarp. Aren't you glad your name is Carnation? Polycarp <laughs> was arrested on the charge of being a Christian. Fast forward several hundreds of years, an author by the name of Josh McDowell wrote this. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Polycarp was arrested on the charge of being a Christian, a member of a politically dangerous cult whose rapid growth needed to be stopped. Amidst an angry mob, the Roman proconsul took pity on such a gentle old man and urged Polycarp to proclaim Caesar is Lord. If only Polycarp would make this declaration and offer a small pinch of incense to Caesar's statue, he would escape torture and death. To this, Polycarp responded, 86 years I have served Christ and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? 
If you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly. I am a Christian. Steadfast in his stand for Christ, Polycarp refused to compromise his beliefs and thus was burned alive at the stake at 86 years old. He obviously, as did Justin the martyr, came after Peter and John and the other disciples. But this was the foundation. As I mentioned, this is the first instance we read of persecution of the church. But Peter and John were laying a foundation. They didn't know it. They were laying a foundation for you and me. They were showing us, okay, guys, this is how it's done. The world's going to come against you. Jesus told us it was going to happen. What makes you think it won't? This is how you do it. You take a stand. You speak the truth. You speak it loudly. And you stand firm. So what was the Christian's defense? The force, remember, was it Star Wars? The force be with you? I'm in the right movie? I was never into that, okay? I watched one of them and was like, I totally don't get this. I'm done. So the force, <laughs> capital F, on the side of the Christians is the Holy Spirit. People don't take that into account when they come against Christians because they don't get it. They don't understand it. But the force with us is the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 of Acts chapter 4, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and you must be thinking, I mean, you must think that Peter was probably thinking, that's a pretty lame reason to be called on the carpet. If we're being taken to task for showing kindness to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Can't you imagine the wheels turning in Peter's mind? You ask us by what power this good deed was done, let me tell you. He's probably thinking, I may never have an opportunity like this ever again. I am going to let it rip. Here he goes. This is his third sermon that we're seeing in the book of Acts. First of all, he says, no doubts, no, no wavering. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom, by the way, you crucified. So he's showing who Jesus is and showing that every one of us is guilty before him. His second point, whom God raised from the dead. Let there be no doubt, Jesus was raised from the dead. And it's recorded in extra biblical historical literature that there was a man, Jesus, who healed people, raised the dead, died at the age of 33, and rose again. It's historical fact. He also said basically the purpose of God was established in spite of opposition. He said the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. What is a cornerstone and what's its purpose? You just throw it in the middle and goes anywhere it goes? So the cornerstone serves what purpose? The what? Meaning? Starting point? Of the foundation? And like you said, you build from that point. It becomes the, the squaring off point. So that the building is an Ohabajang when, when it's done, right? 
So he's saying the stone that you rejected, that literally your people and some of you, Caiaphas, Annas, some of you condemned to death. You were just throwing a stone out there. He became the cornerstone. He became the very one from whom all truth is measured. You treated him like just some rock from the field. He is God's cornerstone for salvation through all history. You heard it here first. <laughs> and then he went on to say what we sang this morning. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. This was Peter's little mini-sermon, but man, it, it packed a punch. He knew he was taking a risk. He knew he could have died for saying this. I mean, he'd already spent one night in prison, right? He was taking a risk. People don't want to hear that they need to be saved. People don't want to hear that they can't save themselves. People don't want to hear that they can't even choose their own way to salvation. People don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Peter was taking a risk. And he didn't start with the custodial staff. He's talking to Caiaphas and Annas and the very captain of the guards who crucified Jesus. Do you think they'd hesitate to crucify him? He took an incredible risk. And John sat there. You go, Peter. <laughs> Guilty by association. <laughs> when we say that today, and they probably said it back then, people's response can be, but this is that's so narrow. Yes. Didn't Jesus mention something about a narrow road gets us to heaven? Well, that's so exclusive. Well, in a way it is. And it even sounds intolerant. We're supposed to be intolerant of sin. That's one thing that has happened in the church during this whole period that we talked about earlier. The change and, you know, wording and the way people believe. The church has softened its view and its preaching on sin. We need, church, we need to be intolerant of sin. God is. But then somebody in the New Testament says something about speak the truth in love. It didn't say be hateful. It didn't say go burn down abortion clinics. It didn't say do all these things that some Christians have done, thinking they're doing God a favor. You know, go buy yourself a lanyard that says, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? We are to be intolerant of sin, but we are to love the sinners. It takes God's grace to do that, to walk that line and see people get saved. We don't even share the gospel our way. We need to share the gospel God's way. allowing the Holy Spirit to give us his words. Because again, the job of the Holy Spirit, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, not condemn us for sin. So who are we as beggars who are trying to show other beggars where they found bread? Who are we to condemn someone for their sin? Because God didn't condemn us. P. 
Peter was basically saying that it was not only the lame man who needed healing through Jesus, but we all need healing. We all need spiritual healing, salvation through him. A man by the name of Everett Harrison wrote this. Salvation was the supreme concern of this prince of apostles. It is found exclusively in Christ and no one else. And it is an imperative need for sinful men. They must be saved. What had happened to the physical condition of the cripple in that he'd been made whole, literally saved, was a parable for the healing of the whole man by the power of of Christ. So what they had seen done physically for the lame man, Peter is equating to their own condition and saying, as he was healed physically, you need to be healed spiritually. He was weak. He was a mess. You're a mess. And you need Jesus. That's what it boils down to. In our sin, we are as helpless in the sight of God as that lame man was in the sight of all the people. We cannot save ourselves. Only Jesus can heal us. We must believe that and place all our faith in him, the only Savior. That's what Peter was saying to them that day. That's what God's word says to you and me. And that's the message the word of God gives you and me to share with others. How are we doing at that? How are we doing? Are we doing? How are we doing? So how do we bring this experience into Acts 29? Remember, we are the characters in Acts chapter 29. What this is telling us is be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. It tells us, see every opportunity to defend our faith as an opportunity to share salvation. If you and I have had an experience with Christ, if we have invited him into our lives and asked him to forgive our sins, we can lead someone else to know Jesus. We know enough. You, you may say, oh, I don't know the Bible. You don't have to know the Bible in its entirety. To lead someone to Jesus, if he's in your heart, if he's real to you, if he's forgiven your sins, if you've got a grasp on the fact that God loves you and forgives, you can lead someone else to that same experience. Don't make excuses. This experience tells us, be courageous Rely on the Holy Spirit for boldness, for the timing, for the right words to say, and for a response on their part. We can be confident that if God is leading us to talk to somebody, and if he opens a door of opportunity for us to talk to somebody, he is already working in their hearts to prepare them for what the Holy Spirit is going to give us to say to them. Isn't that cool? He doesn't even call us to do this on our own, our own smarts, our own strength, our own courage. He gives us what we need, and he builds the opportunities. Who are we to say, mm, not today, God? Not him, God. Who are we to say that? He will give us the boldness, the opportunity, the open door, the words to say, and a response on their part. So then, going back to the title of the message, can people tell that you and I have been with Jesus? They describe the disciples as Basically, plain, ordinary, everyday fishermen. But there was something.
something about them. There was a boldness in them that most fishermen don't have, don't usually have to have. There was a security in Peter knowing what he was talking about. He wasn't talking bubbles. He knew what he was talking about. And there was an authority that most fishermen of that day did not possess. Because, you know, you don't witness to too many fish. So they didn't usually have to have it. But these guys had it. Whatever it was, <laughs> they had it. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. Do people even realize? Do we give them opportunity? Do we give them reason to recognize that we've been with Jesus? Do we? And when God gives us opportunities, do we take them? When he opens a door, do we go through it? Or do we take a detour? Can people tell that we've been with Jesus? Just by being around us. Just by hearing us talk. What are some of the ways, how should people be able to tell that we've been with Jesus? Just call out. How should people be able to tell we've been with Jesus? Our speech. Our actions. Is it? What? Our countenance? Okay, how does it affect our countenance? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? Oh, okay. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in, right? Okay, just, just follow that song, what else? Humility. You think Jesus was tantaran? If anything, it was his humility that struck them, that drew them to him, right? Okay, let's go back to the little chorus. What else? I've got the joy, joy, joy. What else? Faith? Okay. So there should be rock-solid faith, right? Carnation, sorry? Caring. Caring. What's another word, an all-encompassing word for that? That's with an L. Love. Didn't Jesus say people will know your, my disciples by the love you have for each other? Did Jesus know that people were sometimes hard to love? Well, yeah, it was people who crucified him, right? He knew that that's not always easy. But yet he told his disciples and us, the way people are going to know you're on my side is by how much you love them. I've got the joy, joy, joy. I've got the love, love, love. I've got the what? Peace. Didn't a lot of you say last week that was one of the best things God did for you was give you peace? Someone has said one of the surest signs of God's presence is peace. One of the surest signs that Jesus is in our hearts is people, people will notice that we have peace. In times when it doesn't even make sense to have peace, we will have peace. So there are ways that people can know that we've been with Jesus. It's not that we're spouting off scriptures because we know so much. That is not going to draw people to Jesus. But if we love them when they're hurting, that will. 
when they see that we're actually hurting, but we still have the peace of God in our hearts, that will be convincing. People will know that we've been with Jesus. There will be a boldness. There will be a solidness in what we share that will show them they've been with Jesus and I want what they've got. I want that. I need that. Lord, thank you for this example from your word of how Peter and John allowed the Holy Spirit to flow through them. This all was new to them. They'd never been here, done that before, but they followed your cue. They went through the doors you opened, even when they were being intimidated by people. They did not let that deter them. Thank you, God, for their example, and I pray that you would help us to be like Peter and John. Help us, Lord, in the face of intimidation, in the face of opposition, in the face even of persecution. Help us, God, to be rock solid in what we believe from your word. Help us, God, to be loving, to be joyful, to have your peace. And God, help us to be Jesus with skin on no matter what the circumstance, no matter what is coming against us, help us, God, to honor you. In Jesus' name.